Okay, we carry on, archaeology in the Bible. Uh, last week we started looking at archaeological discoveries that are relevant or relate to the period from the conquest, 1406, down through the period of Judges. So from 1406 down to 1051, we're looking at archaeological discoveries that relate to that period. And we looked at the cities of Jericho and Ai, which were part of the, the conquest of central Canaan. And then when we ended, we were looking at the city of Hatzor. Now you'll recall that, that after the Israelites, they gained control of central and southern Canaan. They then turned their attention to the north, and they captured the city of Hatzor, which is described in Joshua chapter 11, verse 10, as the head of all the kingdoms of northern Canaan. They killed the king, they killed all who were in the city, and then they burned the city. And you see that in Joshua chapter 11, verses 10 to 13. Well, Hatzor, as I mentioned last week, it's the archaeological site known as Tel El Qaeda, and there it, it occupies about 200 acres which fits very well with its description as a leading city of, uh, of the, this region because the typical city in Palestine at this time was like 15 to 20 acres. This has an upper and a lower city, and there are a total of 200 acres. Now, the site shows that it was destroyed by fire at a number of different times throughout its history. And when we ended, I was reading to you from an article by an archaeologist named Douglas Petrovich, that he wrote in 2008 in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society. And I wanted to pick back up with that long quote. It's four slides, but uh, stick with me on it. Because we're looking at uh, Hotzer and its relevance to this period. And Petrovich says, but what is known about the Hotzer of Joshua's day? That's what, we, that's what we're interested in. And its end. Yadin, that's Yigael Yadin, who excavated there in 55 to 58 and then again in 68. He says, Yadin described late bronze one Hatzer of the lower city. You've got an upper and lower city here. and he just, So this is the period of Joshua that Yadin described from the lower city. He says, stratum two, as one of great prosperity and cultural standards. So the city of Joshua's time was prosperous, high culture. And then Petrovich continues, he says, as for what is known of the demise of of the late Bronze One city. The opinion of most is that its destruction, visible both atop the tell and especially in the lower city, occurred sometime from about 1455 to 1400 BC. Okay, Joshua's 1400. Okay, he begins the conquest 1406, central, southern, and he winds up in the north. So we're around 1400. He says a temple district was unearthed by Yadin in Area H. You know how they divide up the archaeological site into squares and then they letter them or number them so you know what we're talking about. So he says in Area H, at the northern tip of the lower city, during the excavations of 1955 to 58, to the east of the main Bema or high place, a heap of broken ritualistic vessels were discovered along with fragments of clay models of animals' livers for priestly divination. Yadin notes accordingly, quote, that the temple of Stratum II was destroyed by an enemy and the people abandoned it abruptly. While much more evidence of the destruction of Hatzor of the late Bronze One Age, Joshua's time, has been uncovered in the lower city, Perhaps the most decisive evidence of the same destruction in the upper city is owed to the recent excavations on the slope of the tell as reflected in the excavation reports published by Ben Tor. Amnon Ben Tor has been the excavator, the archaeologist working there since 1990. And I mentioned last week that Petrovich worked with him there one season at, at uh, Hotzer. He says, the following quote, which comes from the excavation report of 2000, relates to the late bronze one stratum of air in area M, which is located on the northern side of the upper city. Now he's going to quote from this report. The pit cut into er an earlier accumulation of fallen mud bricks and ashes. This is the only clear indication found so far for an earlier destruction still in the late Bronze Age, predating the final destruction of the last Canaanite city. The final destruction was around 1230. So this is predating that destruction. He says the earlier phase, i.e. 
of the late Bronze I Age, that's Petrovich's clarification, extending beyond the excavated area was apparently of a substantial nature as indicated by an orthostat, that's a stone slab, associated with it. Now, Petrovich picks back up, so he's quoted that section of that report, and then he picks back up. He says, this, quote, earlier accumulation of fallen mud bricks and ashes, end quote, refers to the remains of the late Bronze I city, that's Joshua City, which must have been burned to the ground after its destruction. A quote from the 2001, the following year's excavation report, a quote from the 2001 excav excavation report, an extremely relevant piece to the puzzle for understanding the demise of the Hotzer of Joshua's day, makes this abundantly clear. Now he's going to quote that report. In this area, the upper late bronze 2B, that's more recent than, Josh, than Joshua's time, he says, in this area, this is the report, in the, in the upper late bronze 2B3 pavement covering the street and the entrance to the citadel was removed in order to investigate earlier phases of construction. This earlier phase ended in a conflagration similar to the one that brought an end to the later phase. So he says this earlier phase, this is late Bronze I, Joshua's time, it ended in a conflagration that is similar to the conflagration of the later stage, which is around 1230. All right. So he says the ceramic assemblage associated with this earlier phase, albeit meager, seems to place the date of this earlier destruction somewhere in the late Bronze I age, 15th century BC. Last slide, Petrovich continues, given Ben Tor's comparison of the fiery destruction of the late Bronze I city to that of the late Bronze II B3 city, so comparing the late Bronze I Joshua's time to this later destruction in 1230, he says, given that comparison, together with Yadin's description of a violent fire and a total destruction characterizing the fate of the latter, so Yadin says the 1230 destruction was brutal. We got total destruction. And he says, Ben Tor says that the destruction from late bronze was similar to that. So he's then, he goes on and he says, evidence of this conflagration, I'm sorry, uh, Yadin's description of a violent fire and a total destruction characterizing the fate of the latter, the Hotzer of Joshua's day clearly was destroyed by a massive conflagration as well. Evidence of this conflagration is visible in Area M on the northern slope of the Tell, thanks to the excavations of 2000 and 2001. Various sections of the burn line and residual burned areas, which measure half a meter in some places, have been preserved since the excavations in this part of Area M ceased in 2001. This burn line visible throughout, an throughout the excavated area reveals the unmistakable signs of a great conflagration. So we're talking about Hotzer. We looked at we looked at Jericho. We looked at I. We looked at Hotzer, which was one of the cities that's burned. And you can see there, there's good reason to believe that Hotzer of Joshua's day was in fact burned, just as the Bible says. Now the later destruction, this this other destruction layer, that dates to around 1230. It's most likely that's from the conquest of Hotzer that occurred during the period of Judges. And that conquest is only implied in Judges chapter 4, verse 24. You have, a, you have the idea of, that in the period of Judges, that there was another destruction of Hotzer. So you have after a long period of abandonment, after Joshua destroys the city in 1400, you then have reoccupation by Canaanites, and the city's re-inhabited by them and ruled by a king who took the royal dynastic title of Jabin, something like Pharaoh, because you'll see this reference in Judges. Long after Joshua has killed a Jabin, you then have in Judges this reference to Jabin. So it seems to function like a dynastic title rather than a personal name. The guy in Judges certainly is not the, one, uh, the person that was killed in Joshua chapter 11, verse 1. So this is Hotzer, so you see not only... Do you have a destruction that comports with what is implied in Judges 4.24? You have a destruction that fits with what is said in the book of Joshua. Now, next I want to look at the Merenpeta. That's, that's actually the name of the pharaoh, but because it's so difficult to pronounce, they switch the letters around, and it's, he's typically known as Merenpeta. 
but his name is Merenpeta, but we're going with Merenepta because it's easier to pronounce. He was Pharaoh in Egypt from, according to Petrovich's chronology, he would put him as Pharaoh at 1223 down to 1213 BC. And after he died, he was eulogized poetically in a stela. You remember that's an ancient upright stone slab with markings on it. He was eulogized poetically in a stela extolling his great accomplishments. And this stela was discovered by a man named Flinders Petrie in 1896 in a temple in Thebes, which is modern Luxor in Egypt. And here is the, here is the Merneptah stela. And it's just neat to me to look at things that old. And so there you have, you can see these, I don't know if you probably can't see them, but these are uh, they're inscriptions, but beneath what you have up there on top. Now, Merneptah is presented in this stela extolling his great accomplishments as declaring the following regarding his military campaign into Canaan, which took place around 1220 B.C. It says here, the foreign chieftains lie prostrate, saying peace. Not one lifts his head of the nine bows. Libya is captured with ha ha while Hati is pacified. Canaan is plundered, Ashkelon is carried off, and Gezer is captured. Yenoam is made, is made into non-existence. Israel is wasted, its seed is not. And Huru is become a widow because of Egypt. All lands united themselves in peace. Those who went about are subdued by the king of upper and lower Egypt, Merneptah. All right, so this is what this person's declaring here. Now, up until the publication in 2001 of Manfred Gorg's reading of that inscription on the Berlin statue pedestal relief that I mentioned when we were looking at Israel in, in Egypt, uh, that pedestal relief, uh, 21687, up until his publication in 2001 of his reading of that inscription, which is tr his, that, that Berlin pedestal relief reading is traceable back to 1400 B.C. But up until that time, this is the only direct reference to Israel in Egyptian records. And it's the only reference to Israel outside the Bible prior to the divided kingdom, prior to 931, 930 B.C. Now the word for Israel that's used in this stela it has a marker that indicates it's referring to a people group as opposed to the marker that's used for the other, other groups which indicates that they are nations or city-states. And that certainly fits with Israel's identity during the period of Judges as a tribal community. You see that they're there and they're, they're kind of a confederation but not looked at as a nation yet. So you have this. Now, the boasting on Merneptah's behalf certainly is not to be taken literally. This is how these people rolled. This is what they did. Many scholars doubt that Merneptah even came in contact with Israel. They think that he included Israel here simply to round out the list of names of the inhabitants of the land. And that certainly wouldn't be something beyond how these people do it. But whatever the extent of Merneptah's campaign into Canaan, God has chosen not to speak about it in Scripture. So this isn't mentioned in Scripture. I bring you this stela because it mentions Israel, and that's something that's significant. Now in Joshua chapter 24, verses 26 to 27, Joshua, he there, he erects a large stone by the sanctuary of the Lord in Shechem. And in Judges chapter 9, Maybe 250 years later, the people have apostatized. You can see that in Judges chapter 8. And apparently they converted the sanctuary at Shechem into a temple devoted to Baal Berit, Baal of the Covenant. And it seems to be the same location as mentioned in Joshua chapter 24, verses 26 and 27. So this later uh, temple to Baal seems to be Joshua's house, that place, Joshua's sanctuary, that they had apostatized and converted it into this shrine for Baal. I think that because you see in Joshua 24, 26, and 7, and also the account in Judges, both of the accounts, they mention Shechem, and both of them refer to a large stone, a tree, and a sanctuary. So it's looking like that's what, that's what has happened there. And you see that in Judges 9, 4 to 6. Now excavations 
last century, they uncovered, they revealed a temple at Shechem. The archaeological site is Tel Balada. And they revealed a temple there with a courtyard and a large stone in front. Now, the archaeologist James Hoffmeyer says, mention was made earlier of the temple discovered at Shechem with the standing stela outside its forecourt. This temple is almost certainly the one mentioned in, Josh, in Judges 9. So what is this? Well, there it is. There is this temple. And these are the remains of the, she the temple at Shechem. And so I just, when you read the Bible and you see these things, and you see people go out and they, and they say, well, what do you know? Here's a temple with this stone here that's referred to. And they uncover that. Now, the Shechem site, it also reveals that the city was destroyed around 1125 B.C., which fits with the time of Abimelech. So it fits with the time of Abimelech. Judges 9.45 says that Abimelech fought against Shechem and razed the city. And so we have here at Shechem, we not only have this temple with this stone in front of it, but we also have the fact that the city was destroyed in the time of Abimelech, as the Bible says. I think that's pretty interesting. I now want to move to the, to the period where we're looking at from the conquest down through Judges. That's 1406 down to when Saul becomes king in 1051. I now want to look at the period from 1051 down to when the kingdom, the United Kingdom of Israel divides, 931 or 930. So from 1051 down to 931, 930. Okay, this is the time of Saul, David, and Jonathan. I'm sorry, Solomon. Saul, David, and Solomon. So I, I want to look at this period. There's not a lot here, but the first thing I want to mention to you is Papyrus Anastasi 1. Now, this isn't a direct connection with Scripture, but I still find it fascinating, and I wanted to share it with you. John Walton, Victor Matthews, and Mark Chivalis, they write in the InterVarsity Background Bible Commentary on the Old Testament, they say champions of this size, speaking of Goliath, they say champions of this size are not simply a figment of Israelite imagination or the result of embellished legends. The Egyptian letter on Papyrus Anastasi I, 13th century B.C., describes fierce warriors in Canaan who are seven to nine feet tall. Well, here is that papyrus, Anastasi 1, and then here is the translation. <clears throat> it says, the narrow defile is infested with shashu concealed beneath the bushes. Some of them are four cubits or of five cubits from head to foot. Fierce of face, their heart is not mild and they hearken not to coaxing. Thou art alone, there is no helper with thee, no army behind thee, thou findest no blank, blank, blank to make for thee a way of crossing. But this four to five cubits, and people who know these things, they estimate that the Egyptian cubit is 52.5 centimeters estimated, which is 20.66 inches, four cubits, I've done the math for you. So we're looking at here, we've got six feet, Ten and a half inches, that's why the guy said seven to nine feet tall, six, ten is close to seven, and then he says eight, seven. So that's what they're saying in this, and people say, well, you know, that's just people talking. All right, it may be just people talking, but isn't it interesting that they're saying this, and then here we have the Bible, this guy, ah, that's crazy, nobody's like that. Uh, what do you know? Here's somebody who's talking like that. All right, we're looking at... at Saul, David, Solomon, this period from 1051 down to 931, 930. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, it reports the contest between the 12 men of Abner, who's the commander of Ishbosheth's forces. Remember, he's a descendant of, of Saul. So we've got this contest that's reported between the 12 men of Abner and the 12 men of Joab. Joab's the commander of David's forces. And this contest takes place at the pool of Gibeon. Now, this is the same site where after the fall of Jerusalem, which the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 587, 586, Johanan, son of Korea, came upon Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. And you see that in Jeremiah chapter 41, verse 11 and 12. So we have this pool of Gibeon mentioned. 
It's mentioned there in, in, as a site of this contest in 2 Samuel 2, and it's mentioned in Jeremiah 41. Well, this pool or reservoir, this was discovered in excavations in 1956 through 1960 by a man named James Pritchard. There's a hole that's about 36 feet in diameter. It was cut through limestone bedrock down to a level floor at about 37 feet. And there's a staircase you can see that winds down to that level floor, uh, to that level down at the bottom. And then from there, there are stairs that drop straight down through a tunnel, another 45 feet down to the water table. And so it apparently was built to provide the inhabitants a secure source of water, a place where they could go that people couldn't do something to the water during the times of a siege. All right, now, I want the next, next section. See, so there's not a whole lot there that we have archaeologically from that period of time. The next segment I want to look at, though, we start to get an awful lot. And this is the period of the divided kingdom. So, you know, the United Kingdom of Israel, it divides after the death of Solomon. So that's 931 or 930. They remain as two divided kingdoms, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. They coexist as divided kingdoms until 722 or 721 B.C. when the Assyrians complete their conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel and cart everybody off. So we're looking at the period 931, 930 down to 722, 721, that time period, roughly 200 years. Okay, the period of the divided kingdom. And we see in, I don't know if you can see that, I hope you can. <clears throat> First Kings chapter 14, verse 25 to 26, and Second Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1 to 9, they report that in the fifth year of the reign of the Judean king, Rehoboam, that Shishak, king of Egypt, conquered or captured fortified cities in Judah, and he was bought off with treasures when he came against Jerusalem. So we, here's this Egyptian king, Shishak. He comes in. He's capturing these cities in, in Judah, and then he's bought off and doesn't take Jerusalem. Well, this is the same Shishak who earlier had given refuge to Jeroboam when Jeroboam fled Solomon. And you see that in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 40. In 1825, an inscription dating from about 920 B.C. was found at the temple of an Egyptian god, a temple of Ammon in Thebes in Egypt, which is modern Luxor, which confirms this raid by Shishak. Shishak is said in that inscription to have destroyed many cities in Judah and Israel for that matter, but Jerusalem's not among them. So you see here, you see this same confirmation that we have from outside source having nothing to do with the Bible. But the Bible tells us this story, ah, these people just making up these stories to give themselves a history and credibility. I said, well, isn't, you know, isn't it amazing yeah. that we find these things, we find this kind of inscription there. Now, Ahab, Ahab was king of Israel from about 874, to 853 B.C. And 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 39, it reports that he built an ivory house. Now that probably doesn't mean that he built an entire house out of ivory. It probably means that the house was full of ivory inlays in the furniture and in wall panels. See, ivory was a luxury item, which is why Amos, about a century later, he referred to it in Amos chapter 6, verse 1 and verse 4, as a symbol of opulence and false security. Amos says there, he says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches. Well, excavations done last century uncovered the royal palace in Samaria from the time of Omri and Ahab. So these Israelite kings. And they also uncovered the remains of more than 200 fragments of ivory inlay found in a storehouse near the palace. And here is an example. Here's one of those ivory inlays. So these things, this is valuable stuff. 
This is what rich people, you know, this is like the, you know, the filthy rich kind of guy, and they got this, this stuff here. And so Amos decries this, how you're living so large, and you're wicked. And so this is, you see that, I find that interesting. 1 Kings chapter 20. It reports Ahab's victory over the Syrian king, not the Assyrian, the Syrian king, Ben-Hadad. Now, rather than kill Ben-Hadad, Ahab makes a covenant with him, and he releases him. Well, you may recall that the prophet then condemns Ahab for having done that. And 1 Kings 22.1 says that Israel and Syria were at peace for three years. So he, he releases Ben-Hadad, makes a covenant with him, and then we see in 1 Kings 22.1, Israel and Syria were at peace for three years. Well, Ahab may have been tempted to make a covenant with Ben-Hadad because of the rising threat that was posed by the Assyrian king, Shalmaneser III. He ruled in Assyria from 858 down to 824 B.C., now, Shalmaneser, he was making his way wester, westward until he was temporarily checked in 853 at the famous Battle of Karkar, which is about 150 miles north of Damascus. Now, Shalmaneser's annals of that campaign, where he's coming west and he is then checked at Karkar, his annals of that campaign, they're inscribed on a stela, that was found in 1861 in a place called Kirk, which is in Turkey. It was found by a British consul, a guy named J.C. Taylor. Now, Shalmaneser claims in the Steeler that he had a great victory at Karkar. He brags that he choked the river with the corpses of his enemies. But the fact he didn't occupy the land and the fact that he did not undertake another campaign west for a number of years makes clear that what in fact happened was that he suffered a setback there. Now, what is significant in this stela, probably a lot of things significant, but what I want to draw to your attention is that Shalmaneser specifically refers to Ben-Hadad and Ahab the Israelite. And he represents them as allies fighting against him at Karkar right in the time frame when Scripture records that they were at peace with one another. I, I think that's just cool. <laughs> you see, so here, here we have, they're at peace for three years. Prophet rebukes him, you shouldn't have done that. They did it, they're at peace for three years, and then we have this outside source saying they're allies fighting against me in 853 at Karkar. All right, interesting to me. All right, three, that three years of, of peaceful alliance between Israel and Syria... That ended soon after the Battle of Karkar in 853 when Ahab, he recruited Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, to help him recover Ramoth Gilead from the king of Syria. So he goes to the king of Judah and he says, let's have an alliance and let's go get this city back from the king of Syria. Now in keeping with Micaiah's prophecy, Ahab was killed in the battle and his son Ahaziah became king. And 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, note that when Ahab died, Misha, the king of Moab, who had been paying tribute, he was, he was a subject of Israel. But when Ahab died, we see reported in 2 Kings that Misha, the king of Moab, Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So we have, we have this in Scripture. Ahab dies, and what happens? This king who has been subject to Israel, he rebels against Israel. Well, in 1868, a Bedouin in Jordan discovered a stela that was three feet high, two feet wide, containing 35 lines of inscription celebrating the accomplishments of Misha, the king of Moab, which he brought to the attention of a German missionary, a guy named F.A. Klein. Now this stela, it is believed to have been commissioned by Misha somewhere between 840 and 820 
B.C. Now, fortunately, a paper mache, what is called a squeeze, was made of the inscription, where you put this stuff on here and you get the, you can press it in and you can pull it off and get the inscription. Fortunately, that, that squeeze of the inscription was made by a man named Jakob Karavaka, and I say fortunately because the Bedouins, not liking that the Turks had been brought in to help negotiate the purchase of the stone, they broke the stone into pieces, scores of pieces. They just broke it all apart. Now some 57 pieces of that stone, about two-thirds of the inscription, were purchased. So after they busted it all up, somebody was able to go back and people bought and bought and bought, trying to reconstruct the original before it had been destroyed. And then using the paper cast, they got about two-thirds of it, and in using that paper cast of the inscription that had been made, a French scholar named Charles Clermont Gonneau, he reconstructed the entire inscription. And you can see, this is, this is here, this is the Moabite stone. I think you can see the pieces that were purchased, and then the smoother black part is what had to be recreated based on that paper squeeze. So here you have, this is the reconstruction of the inscription. Now the inscription records that the, Israelite, that the Israelite king Omri and his sons had ruled over Moab for many years. So this is coming from Misha, or something done in honor of him. He commissioned it, so this is coming from him saying, listen, that, that Israel had ruled over us for many years, but that Misha threw off their domination. It recounts a military campaign that he waged to recover some land from Israel. Now that presumably, presumably was part of the initial rebellion. The scripture just says that Misha, after Ahab died, he rebelled against Israel. Well, presumably then, when Misha's talking about, I captured these things, that's part of what was included when it says that he rebelled against Israel. So that's part of that, that rebellion mentioned in 2 Kings 1.1 1, 1 and 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. Well, that rebellion prompted Ahaziah's successor. Now, you get these names, Joram and Jehoram are really the same names. There's a short form and a long form. So when you get Israelite kings and Judean kings, both named Joram and Jehoram, you see it gets confusing. Yeah. Okay, but uh, Joram is a short form of Jehoram. So sometimes you can just say, well, all right, when it appears over here for the kings of Israel, I'm just going to call him Joram. When it's over here, I'll use Jehoram. But I just want you to be aware of that. And you say, why did they do that? That's just how it was. <laughs> you see, so, but in any event, you have here, you have Jehoram or Joram. I hope the arrow's up there. Yes, Joram, the king of Israel. Okay, he recruits Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, to fight against Moab. Moab has rebelled. According to the Misha stone or the Moabite stone, part of that rebellion includes taking some land back from Israel. And so we have Jehoram, or Joram recruits Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah now, to form an alliance and let's go after Moab. And though Israel and Judah, and they even brought Edom in on this, Israel and Judah, they inflicted losses on Moab. They definitely inflicted losses on them. Joram failed to reinstitute Israelite control over Moab. And you see that in 2 Kings 3. So here, here's this situation where they rebel, they inflict losses and all that, but they don't reinstitute the control. And here you have this stela that is celebrating Misha, who is the rebel who brought Moab out, out from under their domination. And there's this stela right there. The inscription, by the way, the Moabite stone, also refers, refers to Yahweh the God of Israel. So I find that to be interesting. Now in 1994, a world famous uh, epigrapher, a guy who studies ancient inscriptions, I mean you have people who really get into this and they can tell an awful lot of things, but a, a world class epigrapher, a guy named Andre Lemaire, he reconstructed a text at the break near the end of the inscription and see, because it's busted up and because you're going off this paper squeeze to complete it, 
there's a, something missing here, and the question was, what's the letter missing here? And so as Andre Lemaire reconstructed this, he has the inscription read, and the house of David dwelt in Haranan. Now that's significant. If that's correct, it's one of only two or possibly three places outside of Scripture that mentions David. And so if that's correct, we have one of them right here. But of course, people will argue about these things. It's this guy's expert judgment that that is what is there. Ah, you know, I, I don't agree with that. All right, you know how that works. But this guy's no slouch at it. It's not like I went up there and looked at it and said, hey, I think it says this. <laughs> you see, it's this guy who, who knows what he's doing, and everybody knows he knows what he's doing. Uh, so that was his thing. Now, 2 Kings chapter 8. Verse 25 to 29, it reports that Jehoram, or Joram, the king of Israel, and Ahaziah, who was the recently installed king of Judah, that they made war against Hatzael, the king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. So they combine forces and they go make war against Hatzael at Ramoth Gilead. Now Hatzael, he had become king of Syria by murdering Ben-Hadad. You say, oh, how terrible. Come on, that happens, you know. I mean, this, this, politics in the ancient world was a blood sport. I mean, it, yeah, it was really, it was really uh, tough. And you see that if you've ever looked into the, you know, Caesars and all this kind of thing. So here we have Hatzael kills Ben-Hadad. Now Ahaziah, he was Jehoram's nephew, and he walked in the wicked ways of Ahab's house. So here we have this alliance that is made where Joram and Ahaziah, they go and they make war against Hatzael, the king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. Now Joram was wounded in that battle at Ramoth Gilead, and he went to the city of Jezreel to convalesce. So he's wounded, he goes here hoping to recover at Jezreel, and Ahaziah goes and visits him there as he's convalescing in Jezreel. Now this is around 841 BC. Now Jehu, oh look at that man, I even got motion on that thing. Come on. <laughs> now Jehu, he was a military commander whom God called to destroy the wicked house of Ahab. I assume you remember this. He called to destroy the wicked house of Ahab in order to avenge on Jezebel the blood of the prophets and the other servants of God. You see that in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 7. Well, he killed Joram at Jezreel, and his men, they mortally wounded a fleeing Ahaziah who subsequently died at Megiddo. So we've got, we have here, Joram is convalescing from the wounds he got at Ramoth Gilead at Jezreel. Ahaziah comes and visits him. Jehu, who's called by God to eliminate Ahab, Ahab's house, he winds up, he, he, he kills Joram at Jezreel, and they mortally wound the fleeing Ahaziah who goes and dies at Megiddo. And then Jehu, he serves as king of Israel from around 841 to 814 B.C. Now, in excavations done at Dan, Okay, which is a city in the northern Israel. In 1993 and 1994, an archaeologist named Avraham Baran, he found pieces of a stela dating to the mid to late 9th century. Okay, so we're talking about from 850 down to say 810, 805, right in that range. He finds this stela. Now the stela, this stela was commissioned by a Syrian king who refers to his battle with the kings of Israel and Judah. And though the names of the kings of Israel and Judah, they're only partially preserved. This is just how this happens. You know, so, they, so you have to say, okay, well, who are these kings of Israel and Judah that this king of Syria fought about? But in this case, the only pair of kings... Because you've got to have a match. So the only pair of kings who could fit what's left or preserved of the inscription is Jehoram and Ahaziah. Okay, so we now have, see, so this stela very likely was commissioned 
by Hazael to brag about his military accomplishments at the beginning of his reign. So here he's fighting these two guys at Ramoth Gilead. One guy winds up, well, they both wind up dead ultimately. Now, in this stela, in this stela, he, Hatzael may claim to have killed Jehoram or Joram and Ahaziah. He may claim to have killed them. Now, if he's saying that, that obviously conflicts with what the Bible says, the scriptural record, which reports that Jehu killed them. Now, I say he may claim to have killed them because Shigeo Yamada translates the verb there as strike or defeat rather than kill. So he may simply be saying, I defeated them. But the usual sense of the word that's used is kill. Now, if Hatzael, if he does indeed claim that he killed both Joram and Ahaziah, it's not hard to believe, is it, that he would take credit for their deaths? Since both of those kings had been engaging him in battle, Jehoram had even been wounded, and both of them died soon after the battle, within the time Jehoram was recovering from his wounds. So you think this guy's not going to claim that? Sure he's going to claim that. Now, even if he knew about Jehu, let's say he knew about, you know, you would think, okay, he's fighting these kings, fighting these kings, wounds this guy, they go off, and then they're dead. We may just think, God, that's mine, baby. I did that. Okay, but let's say he knew about Jehu. Even if, he, even if he did that, even if he knew about Jehu, claiming credit for their death certainly is conceivable, especially as a piece of propaganda, because it was his forces, right, that wounded Joram, and therefore that set the stage for Jehoram and Ahaziah being vulnerable at Jezreel. They say, yeah, that's me. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Now this stela, this stela refers to Ahaziah as being of the house of David. That's why this is so significant. You see, this refers to being the house of David. There, as I mentioned, there are only two other possible mentions to, to David outside the Bible. You have the Moabite stone with the inscription that is reconstructed by Andre Lemaire. And you have an inscription on the Shawshank 1 inscription in Egypt that Kenneth Kitchen claims also makes mention of David. But those two are more controversial. And so here you have one solid, clear, although I, I will never say anything's not controversial because that's how uh, the academic world works. But this is something that I think the vast majority of people accept and understand, okay? So it's very significant. See, prior to these discoveries, you had a number of modern scholars. You had a number of these guys saying, look, the David narratives in Scripture, that they're simply propaganda that was fabricated during the period of Babylonian captivity to give Israel a respectable history. This is what they claim. That these, he didn't even exist. Some storyteller simply made up these stories so that they would have a noble history. Because here they are just, you know, they're captives over here. Well, that's kind of tough when you got these inscriptions saying the house of David. Not to mention all the other things that we've noted. Now, I know the bell's going to ring, but I'm still carrying on. We're going to go on to the next one. Now, after destroying the house of Ahab in 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10, Jehu ruled as king of Israel, as I mentioned, from 841 down to 814 B.C. So he goes in fulfills this call, destroys Ahab's house. I see. I see how it's going to work. Okay, thanks for coming.